Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of the Nature Clearly podcast. For a while now, I've been looking for an outlet for topics that are maybe not suitable for my typical lecture style videos. This is a place where I want to get more chatty and possibly share my personal experience and opinions on topics I'm interested in and passionate about. And speaking of passions, I'm going to kick off this series with a topic that is very, very close to my heart and I can talk about forever, and that's natural history collections. I think that the world of natural history collections is sort of hidden and very unfamiliar to most people. And to be honest, even though my interest in collections and mainly collecting goes way back to my childhood, I had no idea how big and how important these seemingly archaic places are and how much is involved in creating and maintaining a natural history collection every day. In today's episode, I will give you a sort of overview, or a little introduction, to help you understand what natural history collections are, where you can find them, and most importantly, why we have them, and what purpose they serve. I worked in natural history collections in various capacities for 10 years, I worked extensively in an insect collection, where I focused on specimen photography. I worked with marine invertebrates, where I was dipping my hands in jars with alcohol tinged with formalin, in which the animals were marinated. That was fun. But the most joyful was my work in plant collections, herbaria. If you've been around my channel for a while, you know that botany is my main passion, so herbaria, or plant collections, are really what I'm going to focus on the most today. I started collecting and pressing plants very early on, back when I was in elementary school. And it wasn't just plants. I was interested in collecting and curating rocks of all sorts as well. Back when I was maybe 7 or 10 years old, I had no idea that what I was doing was actually a valid practice, and that some people even do this for a living. I really wish I knew it back then. I was purely interested in natural history objects, and I wanted to keep my findings together, so I can look at them later and maybe study them more closely, compare them to each other. And even though this might just sound to you like a cute hobby, and to be honest, that's how the majority of my friends and family think about it to this day, the curiosity and the need to group, classify and compare organisms really is how the creation of natural history collections started. Taking a natural object and making a specimen out of it, whether it is a plant, a beetle or a seashell, is a unique way of capturing detailed information about that organism from a certain place at a certain time. That is, of course, if all the important information is present along with the physical specimen. I can talk about this a bit more in a future episode. The specimens that are well preserved and cared for will last for a very long time, and become a sort of historical record, capturing a snapshot in time. But to back up a little bit, why would we need these specimens in the first place? I told you I was interested in collecting rocks as a kid, just out of curiosity, and that's really what the first documented collections were about. Curiosity. We humans are naturally interested in the world around us, so capturing and studying organisms that occur around us that live here with us, is a way of understanding nature and the world overall better. Just making sense of it all. Take even just a simple question such as, what kinds of organisms are out there? Nowadays we know a lot about the plants and animals around us, although new discoveries are being made daily, believe it or not. But there was a point in history when we didn't have names for most organisms. Or at the very least, we didn't have scientific names for them. We didn't know what the relationships were amongst these organisms, or that maybe certain species had a close relative species occurring on the other side of the world, or anything about what occurs on the other side of the world for that matter. All the knowledge came from making careful observations, taking notes on differences and similarities, and creating paintings, which was a very popular method of making a record of the organisms. But think about it. Notes and paintings, or even more advanced photographs, only get you so far. When we are studying organisms, we need to have as much information as possible. 
the more information we have, the more attributes we have available to examine, and the more associated data come with the specimen, such as the location and the habitat in which the plant grows, the elevation, the time of the year it flowered, or in the case of many insects, what host plant it was collected on. The more advances we can make in characterizing the organisms and creating a classification, grouping them together and associating them with their relatives. This is, by the way, what we call taxonomy. We describe, we compare and we group or classify, and slowly we build up our knowledge. To be able to do this, a physical specimen is absolutely irreplaceable. We can call it a gold standard for learning about organisms. Even though a skilled artist can capture many important aspects, a drawing or painting can't compete with having the real specimen. It's even better to have the dead specimen than a live organism, as not only can you not examine all aspects of it in a live state, but its behavior and certain characters are altered when it's kept in captivity, so this is not the best choice. So we know why people started collecting specimens, and that curiosity and exploration started it all. But what does a natural history collection look like in practice? At first, before there were any institutions like museums to house the specimens, there were only private collections of individual collectors or scientists. Just to give you somewhat of a timeline, the first plant collections date back to the 16th century while the first surviving pin insect specimens, for example, came a century later. And the best part is that these old specimens still exist. And without spending too much time on the history, let's fast forward and see what natural history collections look like nowadays, and mainly what they are good for. I think that the biggest factor that explains why the general public doesn't know much about natural history collections is the fact They are not normally publicly accessible. Now, you might argue that there are museums that people visit all the time, and I mean, there are hundreds of natural history museums in the world. However, even though you can see some specimens on public display, the real deal, the working collections, are hiding behind the scenes. Every time we had tours or open door days in the collections, people expressed their surprise. So let me try to describe to you what a natural history collection looks like. Let's take an herbarium as an example. Surprise, surprise. The physical space is usually one very large open room, often located in a basement or not really having any windows. In this room, there are rows of tall cabinets that have narrow shelves inside, just big enough to fit herbarium sheets. The individual sheets of herbarium specimens are stored in folders, and those folders are stacked in the cabinets. Now, the most important thing is the organization of these specimens. Each cabinet is labeled with the name of the plant family. So, for example, there might be three cabinets labeled Asteraceae. That's because Asteraceae is a huge family. Or there might be a cabinet containing multiple families. They are all arranged in alphabetical order, so you readily know where each plant family is located. Within those cabinets, the paper folders with herbarium sheets are arranged alphabetically by genus and then by species. Each species usually has its own folder, and of course there can be subspecies or varieties inside as well. Every collection can, of course, have some modifications to this organization, but this is how it works in general. Herbaria can be small, with just a few thousand specimens, or they can house millions of them. Just so you have an idea, one of the largest herbaria, Steer Herbarium of the New York Botanical Garden, and the Kew Herbarium at the Royal Botanic Garden in London, both house around 8 million specimens. And these numbers are growing every year, as thousands of new specimens are added to the collections. This is actually a very surprising fact for many people. And back when I was giving tours in the herbarium where I worked, the number one most frequently asked question was, why do you need to collect more specimens of the same species? Isn't it enough to have one of each? And this is a great question that can be explained by getting into the function of these collections. 
it is not a catalog of all the existing species of plants in the world. So the goal isn't, usually, to have representatives of all of them. But instead, there might be a hundred specimens of, say, Achillea millifolium, or common yarrow. Why? Because every specimen carries a unique set of data. And these data are what make a collection such an important place, a fundamental place, I would say, for a wide range of research. You know, this plant might look a bit different in different localities. Or collecting the same plant at the same place over years might reveal certain trends, such as that the time of the year that the plant's bloom is moving earlier, or later for that matter, which might be possibly linked to a change of the climate or other changes in the environment. And speaking of changes, there might be plants that over time disappear from certain places, or on the other hand, they appear in new places, they expand their range. And all of this can be found out thanks to having the physical specimens of plants, knowing what they looked like at certain places at certain times. I think that already at this point, you can gather why it's common to have many specimens of the same species, and importantly, why we continue collecting and adding more specimens to herbaria. Herbaria, and collections in general, are thus very active places, with specimens coming in and being processed and organized. This is, by the way, how I started my journey in herbaria. I came in as a volunteer, and my job was to mount plants preparing herbarium specimens, which is basically taking folded newspapers with a dry, pressed plant inside and positioning and gluing it, along with the label, on a sheet of paper to create a specimen. To me, it is a mixture of art and botany, and even though people usually like to move on from this job onto different tasks, to me, it is to this day the best part of working in the herbarium, and one of my most favorite activities ever. If you pay attention while doing this, you can learn so much about plants in general, because so many different ones go through your hands, and you see their name on the label, so you get to learn to recognize them. In the United States, which is the only place I have experience working in collections, volunteers are absolutely crucial for the smooth running of these collections. There are often huge backlogs of specimens to be processed, and the paid staff can't keep up with the amount of work. There are also other daily tasks that curators and collection managers do to maintain the collection and to do their research alongside those daily tasks. Going to the field and collecting specimens, whether for a survey or an inventory of local flora or their own specific research, preparing the specimens and processing the field notes that come with them, organizing and filing the specimens, incorporating them into collection, photographing and digitizing the specimens, which is a big thing these days, and I will touch on that later, making sure that the collections stay pest-free, which can be a huge problem, because some insects really enjoy munching on the archival paper, and some like to eat the dry plants as well. I actually saw, unfortunately, a few herbarium specimens where in place of the plant on the sheet of paper, there was just a hole, an outline tracing the shape of the plant, which was completely eaten up. This, as you can imagine, can be disastrous if the infestation is not detected and stopped early. So even this is one of the jobs of herbarium staff. Curators and other scientists working in the collections also spend time identifying the specimens, because not all specimens that come into the collection are identified. I will talk about this more in the next episode. Each scientist has their specialization, because no one can know absolutely everything. Although this varies somewhat by the field of study. For example, it is much easier to know and identify plant species than to know and be able to identify insect species, partly because of the sheer number of different species that belong to these groups, but mainly because of the available knowledge and resources. There's much more unknown about insects than about plants. So in those cases, specialization becomes very important. If one person is an expert in one group, they often visit many different collections where they can gather specimens and properly identify them, organize them, and gather information for their research. 
This is a major function of collections and also a case to show the importance of welcoming research visitors. You can see how this is a win-win situation. The researcher gets more high-quality data and the collection gets its specimens organized and identified. With new advances in the sciences and new methods, we can do more and more with the specimens. We can, for example, extract DNA from old but well-preserved specimens, whether it is a plant or a beetle, and get genetic information that opens up the door to a whole other level of research, looking at evolution, connections, and relationships amongst organisms. But the research methods can be also simpler than that. I, for example, worked on plants of the genus Galium, and a part of my project was to take macro photos of fruits of different California Galium species. And because the herbarium in which I worked didn't have representatives of all species, I did some collecting on my own, and for additional species I was missing, I visited a couple of different institutions where I went through their specimens and carefully removed fruits of species I needed to be able to photograph them. At the same time, I added my identifications to some of the unidentified specimens, or, which is something that's also often done, I put my identification on specimens that had a name I disagreed with. When this happens, by the way, the person who adds the new identification just adds a label with the species name and their name and date to the specimen. We have a rule in our barrier to never cross or remove any prior identification and information, as all of that is important valuable data that can be very helpful in the future. Back to the functions of collections, though. Working in the entomology collection, I witnessed scientists finding and describing new species, in which case the original specimen from which the description of the new species was made, and which is the ultimate official representative of the species, we call it a holotype, has to be deposited in a collection. This can be a collection of your choosing, although of course it's often the one the given scientists work in, but the name of the collection has to be clearly mentioned in the published scientific description of the new species. This is so anyone knows where to find the specimen and to possibly come to see it and examine it if there are any doubts or disputes in the future, or to use it for comparison while making other identifications and this happens a lot. Collections are active and dynamic. Things move and change and get reshuffled with new knowledge. Specimens get exchanged or loaned to different institutions, whether it's for photography, expert examination and identification, or for sampling for genetic work. It is a magical world, at least for me anyway. I hope you gained some understanding of natural history collections. And if you stayed listening all the way to here, then maybe, I hope, it sparked some interest in you. Let me know if you have any questions or if you want to hear more on this topic. Thank you for listening and watching and have a great day.